Well, welcome to this series on burns. And burns are really quite common injuries, particularly so in less economically developed countries, unfortunately. And they're associated with all sorts of problems like loss of function, scarring, psychological disturbance, trauma, psychological trauma, interference with body image. I mean, I don't like any wounds, but I particularly hate burns. They're, they're really quite nasty injuries. They cause pain and the pain can be quite difficult to manage. Very, very painful conditions and, and they can lead on to chronic pain syndromes as well. And then of course there's the always present risk of, of infection with burns and the complications that are associated with infection such as delayed healing time, increased scarring and even the potential for sepsis. And then there's the acute problems we have to deal with, such as hypothermia, hypovolemia, both complications of significant burns, hypercarbia, hypoxia. Then there's the risk of uh, inhalation injuries, which can often be delayed as there's inflammatory changes in the airways, which cause swelling and occlusion of the airways. From the, from the heat of the injury, from the heat of the hot gases that have been breathed in and from toxins as well. And there's the risk of carbon monoxide, which of course we can't detect with our oxygen saturation probes. But for this first video, what I want to look at is some of the fairly common burns we'll see. I'm going to show you some clinical examples. And as always, the main thanks go to the people that allowed their images to be shown with their injuries, which of course is a noble thing for them to do. Now this lady's husband was bringing her a cup of hot tea and he tripped over the dog and the uh, tea spilt on his wife's arm. And we can see here it's quite badly scalded. Quite a large surface area involved but fortunately it was uh, superficial. Only really involving the epidermis. So a scald is a type of thermal injury, it's caused by heat. And specifically, a scald is caused by hot water or steam. Now remember that steam can be greater than 100 degrees centigrade if it's under pressure. So these can be quite significant thermal injuries. And the severity of the injury will depend on the time that the tissues are exposed to the hot water or steam and the temperature of the hot water or steam. Well again this burn is caused by hot fluid being spilt onto the arm and here we can see that the burn is blistered indicating that there are areas of partial thickness injury where as well as the epidermis being burnt the injury has extended down into part of the dermis. Now, as we've mentioned, that the time that the hot fluid is in contact with the skin and the temperature of the hot fluid are going to influence the degree of tissue injury sustained. And we've got some specific information on this from research. So, for example, at 48.8 degrees centigrade, if the skin is in contact with water at 48.8 degrees centigrade for five minutes, that is enough to cause a full thickness injury, damaging all of the epidermis and the dermis beneath, right down to the hypodermis, causing this full thickness type of injury. But hot drinks, which can be at 71 degrees centigrade all the way up to virtually boiling, high 90s degrees centigrade, or even boiling if you've just poured it from the kettle. But anything above 71 degrees centigrade can cause full thickness injuries on contact, almost instantly, or essentially, in, well, instantly, yeah. So it's the time of contact as well as the temperature. So remember, hot drinks, 70, 80 degrees centigrade, full thickness burning on contact. Well, I didn't quite work out the full story on this, but somehow this chap managed to get a hot cup of coffee spilt around the back of his neck. And you can see the extensive scalding around his neck as a consequence of that. Now it's important to remember that there are particular groups of patients who are at increased risk of burn injuries. So for example, this lady has mild dementia 
and she went into the shower at home and this scalding was a result of having the shower at too hot a temperature. Here we see another nasty scold also caused by a hot shower. Now here we see the nasty nature of this injury close up involving quite an extensive area of this lady's legs. Fortunately it's not black or charred indicating it's probably not full thickness and fortunately it's not extensively blistered meaning it's probably not partial thickness. And also when you put pressure on it it blanched readily and reperfused readily indicating that fortunately this was mostly superficial but still a very painful extensive injury. Now quite a lot of burn injuries are associated with smoking and here we see someone who spilt lighter fuel on their hand and the lighter fuel caught fire and this extensive blistering indicates that we're dealing probably with partial thickness injuries, the injury extending down into the dermis of the skin. And it's good that we are seeing less of these injuries now in western countries because fewer and fewer people are smoking. What is particularly sad to see is the increase in smoking in less economically developed parts of the world. Now this child was also burnt with lighter fuel causing quite a significant partial thickness injury. We actually see less of these sorts of injuries in children. In children, young children especially, 80% of thermal injuries are caused by scalds by hot water and steam. But we do see these flame induced injuries as well. Now another mechanism of thermal injury is contact with a hot object where the heat goes into the tissues by direct conduction. And this often leaves an imprint of the hot object that caused the injury, as we see here with this uh, toddler who grabbed a, a heating grill. Here we see another more serious direct contact burn where a child put their hand onto a oven door. And as we can see, there's areas of partial thickness injury causing blistering. Well, this person put their hand on a hot cooking hob when they were trying to reach up into a high cupboard to get something out, forgetting that the hob was on, causing this direct contact injury. Again, the heat going into the tissues by direct conduction. Now it's reasonable to classify friction injuries as burns because the friction between the object, whatever it is, the rope or the carpet, generates heat when it's in contact with the skin. So the moving object over the surface of the skin generates heat. So there is a thermal component to this. Now these often cause abrasions. Now an abrasion is a superficial injury only affecting the epidermis. And these are common, we'll call them scrapes or grazes. But there can be more significant deeper injuries sustained as a result of direct friction on the skin as well. And rope burns are probably the most common. And here we see an example. This is another rope friction burn. This chap was climbing and he started to slip and he grabbed the rope and the rope slipped between his uh, hands. He had to grab it because he was falling. And uh, there was quite a lot of friction before he could bring himself to a, a stop on the rope. Now, as electricity passes through the body, it's going to experience resistance. And it's that resistance to the flow of the electrical current that generates heat. Just as the same as it does in an old fashioned light bulb or in an electric heater. And electric shocks can occur from electrical equipment or from lighting. And direct current equipment is particularly hazardous. And this is an increasing problem with solar panels which produce direct current, which is more dangerous for a particular voltage than the normal um, AC alternating current. And this is a particular risk for people who uh, work on construction, working with uh, electrical things when uh, building and modifying houses and factories and things. And of course it's worse when it's wet because water is going to increase the conduction of electricity. And there's also a risk of what we call electrical arcing, 
when there's high voltage involved because electricity can jump through the air of this high voltage. Now, as we see here in electrical shocks, there's often two injuries. There's the entry wound and there's the exit wound where it exits the body, where the electrical current earths from the body. And sometimes this uh, exit wound can be on the sole of the feet, so it's very important to look all over the surface of the patient's body to look for other less obvious injuries. And electrical current also causes um, subdermal damage. It damages the tissues underneath the skin as it passes through them, so it can damage internal organs and it can, um, it can damage bones as well. So there can be quite significant injuries that aren't obvious at the time. And as well as the acute effects, if someone's electrocuted, there can be muscle spasms, seizures, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, even ventricular fibrillation. Now, chemical burns can be caused by acids or alkalis. And again, these are particularly common in underdeveloped uh, countries. Now, Acids can actually damage the tissues directly and they'll cause a, a coagulation necrosis as well as damaging the tissues directly and, and basically what that means is the blood supply to the area will coagulate, cutting an area off from its blood supply resulting in necrosis. So these could be caused by acids such as hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid or potentially a white phosphorus. Whereas uh, alkalis, um, they will dissolve protein and uh, collagen and can often lead to deep tissue destruction and, and necrosis. So various uh, preparations of ammonia, for example, or tar or hydrocarbons, or as in this case, um, plaster from plastering the wall and uh, cement can also cause alkali burns. And what happened with this chap is he got some uh, cement spilt on him, but then he got wet. So um, it uh, exacerbated the amount of injury he sustained. Unfortunately, this chap also sustained some alkali facial injuries. And of course, acids and alkaline substances are particularly hazardous to mucous membranes and the eyes. So any hot body will radiate heat and the sun is obviously a very hot body and uh, this child's been quite badly sunburned as a result of the incident radiation on her skin. Now, a lot of the ongoing management of burns is aimed at tissue regeneration and healing, of course, but also protecting the patient against infection. Because of the large scale loss of the integumental barrier, burns are particularly prone to infection and these infections can cause localized inflammation but can also cause sepsis and are of course life-threatening. So we need to maintain a high index of suspicion for burns and look out for infected burns and here we see an infected scold in this toddler. So this chap uh, dropped a cup of hot tea on his foot uh, six days ago and we can see that the burns become infected. We can notice the dark coloured granulation tissue, the non-healing of the wound and the spread of the erythema around about the wound, which I would classify as cellulitis. This wound needs very good local management and the patient also needs systemic antibiotics to combat the infection. So this patient came back reporting increased pain, which was actually caused by the infection. And again, we can see the dark discoloration in the wound indicating infected granulation tissue. This is actually a close-up shot of the previous wound showing the dark tissue in this infected scald. Here we see some infection on a scald seven days after the initial injury. Fortunately, no spreading cellulitis, so I'll be fairly optimistic this should respond well and uh, fairly readily to treatment. 
Well, this patient also reported increased pain and we can see swelling and redness around about the forearm burn. And we can also see some lymphangitis here as the bacterial infection is spreading up the efferent lymphatic vessels towards the axillary lymph nodes.